just waiting for the recording. Okay. Welcome back, everybody, to our second lecture on um, PC 106 Interpreting Scripture. We are just taking time to look at difficult uh, passages and try to interpret them and try to understand them correctly. So, like we mentioned earlier, there are two passages in the New Testament that are difficult or are, are uh, have to deal with um, about whether women can minister in church or not. So we looked at one, which is 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, verses 34 and 35. Uh, there is another passage in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 to 15. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8 to 15, which uh, is a difficult uh, passage, which we will look at. Uh, but before we go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, 8 to 15, I want, to, I want us to go to Ephesians chapter 4, uh, because if we answer that, uh, Ephesians 4, then we will be better able to understand uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. And uh, let us look Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to look at verse 8 through 11. Ephesians 4, 8 through 11. Uh, or let's read verse 7 through 11. Ephesians chapter 4. Let me write it down here. Um, Ephesians I-A-N-S 4, 7 to 11, okay? So we're going to uh, look at this first, and then we are going to go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. So Ephesians 4, 7 through 11, uh, I will read the passage, and then I will put the question to the class to discuss, and then we will discuss it and then go to the next passage. So Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 through 11, Paul the Apostle wrote, he says, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first ascended into the lower parts of the earth? He who ascended is also the one who he who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. And he goes on. Okay. The question I want to ask here is, can a woman, can a woman, be an apostle, a prophet, a pastor, teacher, evangelist, pastor, and teacher? Or is this only for men? Is Ephesians 4.11 only for men? Or can a woman also be in, in the role of an apostle or a prophet or an evangelist or a pastor or a teacher? The reason... Some may think that Ephesians 4.11 is only for men is because of what it says in verse 8. It says, he gave gifts to men. He gave gifts to men. And then verse 11 tells us what those gifts are. Some he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. So question is, can a lady, can a woman be either an apostle or a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, or a teacher? What do you think? Anybody, this is just free discussion, so you don't have to worry about being right or wrong. Just share your thoughts. Question is, can a woman be an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher? Please go ahead, Abu Bakre, the Biloba. Please go ahead, please. Thank you, Pastor. Good morning, sir. Good morning. 
what I saw in this passage, the man that Paul referring to here is woman, woman being. Because my translation in my own language translates as woman, woman being. It's not specific, uh, specify maybe the man or a woman. Mm. We, you know, men or women. So, so he's referring to both female and male. Both women and, ma and men. So in this place, and the fact that he's referring to both men and, um, male and female here, and the verse 11 is talking about also men and women. Mm. So that means women can be an apostle, can be a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor and a teacher. Mm. But the only question I have under this place is can a woman lead the church? That is the problem I have on, on that place. I mm. believe uh, women can be an apostle, can be a prophet, an evangelist, pastors and teacher. But can a woman lead the church? That is my question. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, good. So, so the first part, the first part, of, I mean, the question, the first part of the question, uh, Abu Bakre, Tabilwa, answered it correctly, right? So, remember, when we, we one of the things we learned uh, in, in the early part of the course is to study the words and study it in the Greek whenever possible so we can use our study tools. So when you go and look at verse 8, it says, and he gave gifts to men. That word men, in which in the English Bible is translated men, but in the Greek, the, the Greek word is anthropos, which is just meaning human being. It's not referring to male or female. Right? And so like Abu, Abu Bakr said, you know, in his, in his language translation, it's human being, which is correct. That same word anthropos is used in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, when Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. So in the English Bible, it is translated as man, but it literally means male and female, people. It just means human being, people. He's saying uh, people will not live by bread alone, but every they'll all have to live by the word of God. Right? So it's the same word, anthropos. So Matthew chapter 4, verse 8, he gave gifts to people. He gave gifts to human beings, not just men but he gave gifts to everybody, male and female. So, verse 11 must be understood in the context. Notice in verse 7, he says, to each one of us, that is, brothers and sisters, male or female, human beings, people, all of us who are in Christ, all of us have received grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. That means whatever gift Christ wanted, he has given it to us. Everybody, male or female. So that's verse 7. Verse 8, men is, I mean, the English Bible, men, literally the Greek is anthropos, which is gender neutral. It's people. So therefore, when we get down to verse 11, we have to keep that same thought, that is, Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher is open. These giftings are open for both male and female. It's not, it's not uh, specific to. Uh, is that noise too much? Yes. Can you hear the noise? I mean, I couldn't turn it off. Can you hear it's clear. Me? It's clear. You can hear me clearly. Yes, 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 it's clear, sir. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So, um, so that is the correct way to understand, right? But 
Abu Bakr brought up another question, which is also very important. Okay, we will accept, we will accept that uh, men and women can be called into any of these five ministry functions, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. But the next question is, can a woman lead the church, a congregation? Can a woman lead a congregation? That is a tough question, but we have to answer. We have to have an answer, okay? So what we have to do is, now we know from Ephesians 4 that women can be in these ministry functions. They can be, a woman can be an apostle, a prophet, a evangelist or pastor or teacher. So now, if you look at some of these functions, especially that of an apostle or that of a pastor, these two especially imply leadership. An apostle, really, an apostolic ministry is somebody who's, you know, is leading the way, you know, in, in certain area, whatever, the, the, in whichever sphere of influence God has given them. Apostolic is they're leading the way. Same thing with the prophetic, uh, not with the pastoral. You, 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 a pastor is a spiritual leader of a congregation. So if a woman is a pastor, she's a leader. If a woman is an apostle, she is a leader in that case, right? So keep that thought in mind. Now let us go to another difficult passage, which is 1 Timothy chapter 2. And then we will try to answer that question. You know, uh, can a woman lead a congregation or lead a ministry? You know, uh, we have to answer that. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And we want to read verses 8 through 15. This is another difficult passage. And this is another passage that sometimes people use, and they, uh, especially in certain uh, denominations, in certain uh, Christian traditions, uh, very, very strong. They will not allow a woman to minister the word of God, to teach. Very strong. Um, and they will use this like First Corinthians 14 and First Timothy chapter 2. But let's read it and let's try to understand it. First Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 to 15. I will read it. We could uh, uh, just please follow with me. The Apostle Paul is writing. He says, I desire therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission, and I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. For Adam was not deceived, but the woman was being deceived, fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. So uh, this is a, quite a difficult passage because 1 Timothy 2 and verse 12, uh, um, he, he is very clear. He says here, I, I do not permit a woman to, uh, let a woman, verse 11, let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man but to be in silence, okay? So, how do we understand it? How do we apply this? 
And how do we answer the question, can a woman teach the word of God? Can a woman be in leadership? So on. Okay. So, first of all, what is the context? Right? The context is, he is dealing with conduct. In verse 8 through 15, he is dealing with conduct. He is not dealing with a church service. So what is the context? The context is not church service. The context is life conduct. How do we know that? Because you look at verse 8. I desire that men pray in the church. No, he's not talking about church. I desire that men pray everywhere. That means wherever you are. So it's not the context is not church service setting. The context is daily life and conduct. So in daily life and conduct, how should men behave? Men should behave, they should be prayerful. I'm looking at verse 8, okay? They should be prayerful. They should lift up holy hands. What is that? They should live a life of surrender. Lifting up holy hands. That means your life is consecrated to God, surrender to God. And they should not be in wrath and doubting. That means don't live uh, with anger, don't live in doubt. Doubt of God, doubting God. So this is how men should live. So we say, okay, in, in your life and conduct, everywhere, men, be prayerful, live a life of surrender. Don't be angry. Don't be doubtful about your faith in God. Next, women. In like manner, that means, women, this is how you must conduct yourself. Where? In the church? No. Everywhere. So he's talking about life conduct. He's not talking about church service. He's saying, women, you clothe yourself with modesty. Don't let your focus be on, you know, uh, the gold, the pearls, the costly clothing. But verse 10, you profess godliness with good works. So the context is not church service. The context is how you live your life. Men, be like this. Women, be like this. The second thing I want to point out is, even though Paul in these two verses, he's saying women, talking to women, he says, you know, your focus should not be gold or pearls or costly clothing. Do we allow women to wear gold, pearls, costly clothing? Of course. Because, you know, when we go to First First Peter chapter 3, where Peter wrote, you know, women, you know, let it be the hidden man of the heart and be like Sarah. Well, if you look at Sarah, she wore gold and silver and costly clothing. In, if you go to Genesis, the 24th chapter. So Peter says, be like Sarah. But hey, Sarah wore gold, pearls, I mean, costly clothing and so on. So it was not about just completely forbidding, but... It's telling us, don't make the focus on that. You walk in with, with godliness. Okay, that's a side note. So the first thing I want, to I want us to understand is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8 to 15 is talk not talking about church service. It's talking about daily life and conduct. That is, this is how men must behave everywhere. In your house out on the street, wherever you are, everywhere you be like this. Women, everywhere, this is how you live. Your focus must be in godliness and uh, good works. So with that in mind, then you understand verses 11 and 12. That means in your daily life and conduct, women, be in submission to man. Don't overrule your man. So verses 11 and 12 is not talking about church. 
It's talking about everyday life. And the context has to do with the husband wife. Why? Because the next few verses is talking about a woman bearing children. Adam and Eve, women bearing children. So he's talking about a, a, a marriage relationship, right? Adam and Eve. It's not just saying any woman, any man. No, no, no. This is a special relationship. Adam and Eve, marriage relationship, childbearing. So the context of verses 8 through 15 is twofold. One is everyday life and conduct. And from verse 11 to 15, the context is more specific about a husband wife like Adam and Eve. In that context, woman or wife, be in submission to your own husband, which is what the Bible teaches in other passages. Don't try to teach your man, but and don't try to take authority over your husband. No, but you walk in submission. Why? Because of Adam and Eve. It's a relationship, husband-wife relationship. It's not like any man, any woman. No, the context is Adam and Eve, husband-wife relationship. In that context, wife, you be in submission to your husband. He is your uh, leader there, and God will protect you in your childbearing. So how must we understand First Timothy chapter 2, verse 8 to 11? I'm repeating. The context has to do with two things. One, it has to do with everyday life. How men should conduct themselves. How women should conduct themselves in everyday life, everywhere. Second, the context transitions, it changes from verse 11 to verse 15. It changes to an Adam and Eve context, which is a husband, wife, married man, married woman and man. In that context, woman, you do not try to teach your husband. That means you don't try to uh, override your husband, but you walk in submission, which is what Ephesians chapter 5 teaches us, which is what Colossians chapter 3 teaches us. Everywhere else, the same truth. So scripture must be interpreted in the light of scripture. The same person who wrote First Timothy 2 also wrote Ephesians 5, also wrote Colossians 3. So the understanding is the same, that wife, you walk in submission to your husband because God has given him as your uh, protector and overseer. So you walk that way. It's not local church context. He's not talking about preaching and teaching in church. That is not the context of First Timothy chapter 2, 8 to 15. Later on, chapter 3, verse 1 goes into the local church context. Did, uh, was that clear? Uh, did you understand that? Any questions on that? So, okay, I see your comment in the chat. So now we can go back to the other question, which is, can a woman lead a church? Can a woman lead a church? We know that in the context of husband wife, the husband is the head of the wife or provides leadership to the wife in the con in the marriage marriage context. So in that context, Adam and Eve context, Eve is subject to Adam. Don't try to uh, have authority over your husband. No, you be submitted to your husband, that context. But we shouldn't take that and apply it to a woman who is called to be an apostle or is called to be a pastor. A woman who is called by God to be an apostle, she has to fulfill her calling. So let's say a woman is a married woman but she's called to be an apostle. 
or let's say a married woman is called to be a pastor. Both these apply to her. That means as a wife, she will be in submission to her husband. But so that's part one side of her calling. She's a wife. She must be in submission to us. But that same woman, is, if she is called to be an apostle, then as an apostle, she is in leadership. What she does as an apostle, she is answerable to God, not to her husband. What she does as a wife, she is answerable to her husband. That same woman, if she's a married woman, if she's called to be a pastor, as a wife, she is in submission to her husband. She is answerable to her husband. As a pastor, she is a leader of her congregation. She is answerable to God. She is a shepherd. The chief shepherd is Jesus. Okay. So, you must understand that in different contexts, the authority structure is different. In the home, Adam and Eve, Eve, be in submission to your Adam. Don't try to teach him and take his authority, his place. No. But in the church, if God has called a woman to be an apostle or a pastor or a whatever, they have to fulfill their calling and they're answerable to Jesus Christ who gave them that responsibility. So to answer your question, can a woman lead a church? Yes. If she is called by God to lead a church, she has to lead the church. Can a woman pastor a church? Yes. If she is called by God to pastor a church, she has to pastor a church. She's answerable to God. But that same woman at home, as a wife, she is submitted to her husband. As a mother, she cares for her children, all those things. So the same woman is handling different roles or responsibilities. And the authority structure is different. Okay. Is it clear? So we have answered or we have uh, gone through uh, two difficult passages concerning whether a woman can minister. And uh, the two passages are 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 34 and 35, and 1 Timothy chapter 2, 8 to 15. These are the two difficult passages. But like we said, in both cases, if you just look at the context, that means what is Paul addressing then? and you interpret it in the context, then it is very clear. But if we take the verses by itself in isolation, then it becomes very confusing and then it's difficult for us. Okay, so the key in both these passages, 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Timothy 2 is context. What is he talking about? Actually, the context is very clear. We just have to see it. Then the explanation is, uh, is easy to understand. Okay. And also, like we said, scripture must be interpreted in the light of rest of scripture. So the same writer, which is Paul, what else did he say about the subject in other places? You know, then then we can interpret it right. Okay. Um, everyone's with me so far. Any any questions on these two things? I know, or the general question: Can a woman um, minister the word of God? Can a woman uh, be in the ministry? O along those lines, any questions? Okay. We will go to. One more passage. Again, uh, this is, it may or may not be difficult, I don't know. But let's please go to First Corinthians chapter 11. 
and this has to do with head covering okay uh, in some places this becomes a very very contest contentious issue some places uh, 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 you know uh, some places it is uh, they don't worry too much but in some parts of the Christian church this becomes a big argument uh, so we have to try and understand this okay first Corinthians chapter 11 we want to read 1 to verses 1 to 16 okay first Corinthians chapter 11 1 to 16 the question is about head covering okay the question we want to ask is very simple should women cover their head when they are in the church service or is it optional in some places they insist based on this first Corinthians chapter 11 that women must cover their heads in some Christian churches it's okay they don't they don't force it uh, if you want to cover your head it's your choice it's up to you you know you do it but it's not forced so how should we understand it correctly and the main passage is first Corinthians chapter 1 verse 1 to 16 so can somebody read these verses for us and then I want to hear your uh, I want to hear from the students from your class from the class what do you think right first Corinthians chapter 1 verse 1 to 16 11, first Corinthians chapter 11 1 to 16 somebody could read it for us please Anyone? First Corinthians chapter one verses eleven to sixteen. Uh, sorry, uh, chapter eleven. Uh, chapter eleven. One to one. Okay, sorry, Pastor. First Corinthians chapter eleven verse one onwards. Imitate me, just as I also imitate Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head un uncovered dishonors her head. For that is one and the same, as if her as if her head were shaved. For if a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For man is not from woman, but woman is from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. For this reason, the woman ought to have symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For as woman come, came from man, even so man also comes through woman, but all things are from God. Okay, till verse 16 yeah yeah uh, verse 13 judge among yourself is it proper for a woman to pray to god with her head uncovered does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair it is a dishonor to him but if a woman has long hair it is a glory to her for her hair is given to her for a covering but if anyone seems to be contentious we have no such customs no nor do the churches of God. Mm. So, this is a difficult passage. There are many difficult uh, pieces in this passage. Many, many. But we want to answer one question first. To begin with, we could discuss other things later. But one question. 
based on this passage, should we make it compulsory for women to cover their head? I mean, put a shawl or something, sorry, to cover their head when they come to the church service? Or is it not mandatory? How should we interpret this passage? Because I know, you know, uh, some, like I was saying earlier, some places very strict. And sometimes I've gone when I was, when I traveled to different places, pastors, they start fighting. <laughs> oh, how about this? You know, it becomes such a big issue. I, I want to hear from you. What do you think? How to understand this passage correctly? Anyone can share. Uh, because it is written addressing Corinthians church, it is not mandatory for us to uh, be a head covering. It is purely optional. Okay. So John is saying, now this is uh, specific to the Corinthians. Okay. So that is one, one thought. Okay. Abu Bakre, please go ahead. Uh, well done, sir. Sir, the, the contents of this place has to do with the culture of the of the Corinthians. And because uh, the way we live and our culture determines sometimes the way we worship our God. Mm. So some places they don't use to cover their head. Normally they don't use to cover their head. And in some culture, the, even whether you're a Christian or other religion, you must cover your head. So in this place, I see it as if so it's dependent on the area Christian find himself or based on the culture that abound with the with the Christian in their area so if you are you are a, a, you are in culture that they used to cover their head is in go in line with your with you that anytime you want to appear in your god in your presence in the presence of your god you must co you must cover your head but in the case where maybe your culture is not is not is not important in covering of head is not important in your culture so it does not mean that you should force yourself to cover your, your head when you want to. Look at the European country. Women used to wear trousers. They count it as their own part of life. But mm. in, our, in, in Africa here, most especially in Nigeria, in our own culture, if women wear trousers, we look at that woman as, as a lot. Mm. A prostitute. So we know we don't we don't want, we don't like it here. It's not part of our culture. So it's depend on individual culture. So whether you mm. cover your head or you will not cover your head. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, Abu Bakr also says, you know, it depends on the local culture. And so um, First Corinthians eleven is addressing. The culture in Corinth, just like Paul, John also, John Paul also said, it's addressing the Corinthian church. Okay. Anybody else with that, you know, any other thought, any other uh, response based on this passage? Should we insist women must cover their head or how do we interpret this? Anyone else? Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So I think, uh, uh, so, you know, when you look at this whole passage, we, we should ask ourselves qu several questions, right? Uh, we know that uh, in Paul's episode, Epistles. There are things he addresses which are very specific to that 
particular church. So there are matters that are very that that are specific to that church. Example in the Corinthian church, we know there was division. So he was addressing that. There was a man who was committing sin. Uh, um, that's First Corinthians chapter five. So he was addressing that. They had other problems like about how they would come and eat in the Lord's table. They would fight with each other to take part of the bread and the wine. So he was addressing that. So we know that in Paul's letters to the Corinthian church, he was addressing certain matters which are not a problem in every church, but are specific to that church. Like we mentioned some examples. So therefore, it is safe for us to even say that this head covering issue was specific to the Corinthian church and not intended for everybody, all churches. And as we read in verse 16, right, Paul sums up his instruction by saying that we have no such custom nor do the churches of God. In other words, yeah, we are not enforcing this in all the churches of God. Right? It's he himself says in verse 16, this is specific to your situation, the Corinthian church situation. So then that is when we need to get back into understanding the culture of the people. So, and we need to read up a little bit on the history and what is happening there. Right. So that's one thing. Secondly, we also have to look at it very logically. I mean, in the light of the rest of scripture, as New Testament believers, Jesus taught us, we worship God in spirit and truth. It's not about whether I cover my head or not. Does that mean if a man is wearing a cap for whatever reason, maybe it's very hot, maybe it's very cold, so he's covered his head, or maybe he's riding on a bike, so he's wearing a helmet, or maybe, you know, whatever situation where he's wearing a cap. Does that mean just because he's got his head covered, he cannot pray? No, he can pray. Because prayer is from the heart. It's not just whether you cover your head or not. right? So we know that spiritual truth. So the same thing will apply for women also. Whether a woman is, is wearing a hat or not wearing a hat, it's okay. She can worship God in spirit and truth. right? So that's the second thing. So we must come from that perspective. Otherwise, we will put people in bondage uh, by you know these outward things. So... Spiritual truth must also be brought to bear. So culture, spiritual truth, uh, the context of what's happening in the New Testament believer must be brought to bear. And when we get into the culture, and this is something you can read generally, general information. You see, in the Corinthian church, uh, Corinth was a city where there was a lot of prostitution. And the prostitutes, the temple prostitutes, shaved their heads. So that is what he's referring to. And in chapter 6, he did mention, such were some of you. You know, that means they, some of the people had come out of those kinds of lifestyle. Such were some of you. But now you're washed, sanctified, justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So these women who were previously temple prostitutes, they had shown their head. They had come. They had become saved. They had come to Jesus. So now... You can imagine they're sitting in the congregation, their heads are all shaved because that was their previous life. And they're sitting there. So Paul is saying, okay, look, cover your head. That's all. Okay, So that's the cultural context. And it's, uh, it's a symbol of authority. Right? It's showing that you uh, are in submission. You have a husband, you're married, or you're in submission to God. So... Uh, uh, you know, you cover your head. And then he concludes that passage by saying, we don't, if anybody is arguing about this, we don't have any custom like this in our other churches. So he's basically saying, I am speaking this very specifically for the Corinthian church. So therefore, we should not take this passage and make it compulsory for every women in every church to cover the head. No, 
we leave it off. If it is hot and some somebody wants to cover the head, that is their choice. If it is very cold and somebody wants to cover the head, that is their choice. We know that we worship God in spirit and truth. So this doesn't matter. Okay. So uh, I think, you know, just hearing all of you, I think, uh, you know, we, we kind of understand this. Uh, it is uh, something uh, we, we, we all agree on. Okay. So we will close here for today. Next week, we'll just pick up some other passages. I'm just, you know, taking uh, different portions of scripture passages uh, which are generally, you know, uh, difficult or people have, uh, you know, uh, different opinions on it and just trying to explain it and trying to understand it so that we can all be clear. Okay. So let's close in prayer. We'll continue next week, Thursday. Could somebody please pray and we will dismiss. Anyone? Holy Father, we thank you, Lord, for teaching, you, teaching us from your word. Lord, whatever we have heard, help us, Lord, to receive it well in the right understanding, in the right perspective, that we may apply it rightfully in our lives. Mm -hmm. We may understand the context in which it is written, and we may Take into account the spiritual truths, Father. And taking rightfully from your spirit, the spiritual truths present in the passage, you may do all things rightfully in us, so that what we do and what we practice in our life will be acceptable and pleasing. Mm -hmm. Lord, we thank you for Pastor teaching us these things. Bless him, Father, bless his ministry. Greatly in the days to Bless every one of us. Teach us more love from your word in the coming days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And uh, have a, a good break and get ready for your next class. Thank you. Bye now.